Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Chrissy Kelly and I am from Absent, as you all know by now. Um, amazingly, this is our 20th webinar. I don't know how that happened, um, but I'm, it's my great pleasure to uh, have my lovely guests this evening. I have um, uh, Deka Burgess Watson, who is from Newcastle, and she and I are working together uh, in the, on the subject of parosmia and food. Uh, we have Dr. Jane Parker um, also from the University of Reading, uh, and I know you've all seen Jane before in these parosmia sessions. And then we also have Aiden with us, who is going to be manning the Q and A bar. So I would like to ask you if you do have questions in the course of the evening, please use the question and answer bar. That will make it easier for us to know who we've answered and who we haven't. Um, and let's leave the chat bar for other technicalities if, if something goes wrong or you can't get in or whatever, um, or you, I don't know what eventuality there might be to use the chat bar, but let's keep the questions in the Q&A bar. Right, okay, so um, I know that uh, parosmia is of great interest to many of you. Uh, we, we seem to be seeing parosmia with a large number of cases um, of, of COVID-19 related smell loss. So this is something that we are really thinking about a lot. Um, together with Deka and Jane, we have been doing a lot of research. We've got somebody in the audience, I believe, who has also been working on that with us, um, Barry Smith. Hi, Barry. Um, and uh, we are slowly but sure, surely making a little bit of progress in the area of parosmia. Um, I'm guessing that most of the people in the audience are members of the Facebook group, but if you have come in um, to this uh, event this evening through Twitter or through the website. Um, I would, and even if you're not really a Facebook person, um, well, actually, if you're not a Facebook person, we've got good news because we're going to be going to a new platform um, a little bit later in the month. Um, and I'll mention that a bit more later, but um, we are developing <clears throat> more and more resources for people like you who have parosmia. So I think there's um, there's reasons to be cheerful about parosmia. Excuse me. <clears throat> so um, let's, uh, Jane, why don't we start with you? Um, you and I have been working very closely on to, to learn more about parosmia. So what can you tell us um, based on our what, the most recent research that you've done? Oh, straight into the hard stuff. Straight then. into the hard stuff. And I'm just going to turn off my heat because suddenly it's very warm in here. Hold on. Well, we're just writing up two papers and we've got a lot of papers in store because we actually gathered a lot of data from our participants. Um, so much so that we've got a huge backlog of things to write up and there's a lot of interesting things coming out of it. Um, I suppose one of the main things, um, one of the key things that we were looking for is actually to find molecular triggers in parosmia. Now by that I mean you, we've all talked about food triggers. So this food triggers my parosmia, this, this beverage triggers my parosmia. <coughs> but what we're finding is that if we pick these foods to bits we can separate out all the different components of the flavour and we're finding that a lot of people are reacting to the same chemicals essentially in the foods. They're not added and artificial, they're all there present in foods anyway. Um, we've done a lot on coffee and we've got a group of about 15 molecules that most of you, or certainly most of the volunteers we had, are reacting to. Now, not everybody reacts to any single one. So we've got a group, there's a bit of an overlap, but basically most people are finding the same group of compounds are triggering their, triggering their parosmia. Now, the really interesting thing is that when we then look at people who are tasting chocolate or smelling chocolate, we find the same compounds. And if we look at people who are sensitive to peanuts, we're finding the same compounds. Um, and basically if we within this sort of category of cooked food or roasted, baked and fried, it's pretty much the same group of compounds that are causing the problem. Now, they may go up and they may go down. So there will always be exceptions. Uh, you know, you won't all dislike chocolate because you dislike coffee. But 
as a general rule, it's the same sort of compounds. And then we move on to vegetables and fruit. And that's interesting because that's a different set of compounds and we need to just dig those out. I haven't got any answers for you on that one. I know onions and garlics, garlic is really bad and that's a different set of compounds. Um, and yeah, I was going to mention the third thing. Um, perhaps it's a bit early in the evening to mention the third thing. <laughs> but it, it's fascinating actually because we have, we know that poo is also a a problem who and is the third thing <laughs> who is the third thing that I wasn't going to mention but I think we have to mention it now and basically it's the same compounds we're finding in there that are triggering your distortion of poo so actually it becomes nicer because it becomes more like coffee or biscuit or whatever um, and that's something that we're just starting to tease apart um, yeah not literally but um, so all of that for me is, <clears throat> is fascinating the other important thing is where we're heading, because it's great for me as a flavour chemist to work out what all these molecules are, but why does it help us? And at the moment, I'm talking to Simon Gain a lot about how we explain these theories, and we've got some interesting insights. We haven't quite got to the bottom of everything, but we've got a lot of, we've drawn up all the current hypotheses, um, and we're looking to see how it all fits. And so once we've kind of got a bit more of the understanding of what's going on, you know, then then we're making a bit of progress. And that's what's really exciting for us. And and for those of you who don't know him, uh, Simon <coughs> Bain is an ENT uh, and also an absent trustee. He works at the Royal National Throat, Nose and Ear Hospital in London. Um, and he is very much part of this uh, this investigation of parosmia. So um, that's that's who Simon is. And by the way, I was sitting here horrified thinking, I didn't introduce Aiden. That's not good enough. Aiden, by the way, is, is yes, he's always been helping us. And, and I met Aiden when we, uh, when we started our research at the University of Reading. So it's nice to have you here with us, Aiden. Thank you for the second introduction there. <laughs> well, I mean, it's fine. I'm a very tired woman at this point. It's fine. <laughs> I go all day, every day, and I'm just pretty much yeah, I'm ready for a, a holiday. Well, thank you. Oh, I actually introduced you twice. That's that's really bad. Okay, um, right, uh, Deka, mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit. Um, we've we've spoken a little bit about understanding people. Uh, let's talk about what we can do to help them. How can we make their lives easier? So let's talk about food and just basically living with this these horrible horrible smells. Yeah, there's, there's so much we could talk about. But before we do, I wanted to go back to Jane, because obviously, one of the potential benefits of knowing what the triggers are for parosmia is also knowing what sorts of foods that we can avoid um, that are triggering the, the parosmia. And so, um, you know, one of the things that we've, we've discussed before, Chrissy, is this idea of a parosmia plan of thinking about foods that are safe, and then perhaps having some bold strategies of things that that um, have quite a strong flavour but don't trigger the parosmia. Mm. So, one of, so, so, so there are certain foods that don't seem to trigger it quite so badly. And I'm wondering that perhaps it would be great to know um, what the chemistry is of, of those products as well in order that, that we can use some of those products more. So one of the ones that really interests me, and I'd love to, to hear your views on this, Jane, is, is, is vanilla and cinnamon. Um, some people seem to find cinnamon a really good bold strategy to add to their food that sort of masks all the other off flavors and some people seem to find vanilla is quite helpful but people seem to be divided on that and i wonder if if that's something that that <coughs> we're thinking about as well um let's start with vanilla or va vanilla mm -hmm. um obviously it's got 150 200 components to it so it's not a right. single right. molecule so, so there's lots coffee. of things in there and one of the things that's occasionally a trigger in meat is a compound called guaiacol. Um, and this is a smoky compound. And it's also present and its derivatives in vanilla. So it might be that there's a bit of an overlap there. I don't know. I would need to find somebody who has distortions from vanilla and put them through. It'd be very easy to do. We know a lot about the, the chemistry of vanilla. Um, it might be that. It could be other things. I mean, the things that are cropping up are quite surprising. It's, mm. it's not the obvious. Okay, it's vanilla, so it must be the chemical called vanillin. It's not. 
um, you know, it, it's more subtle than that. But it might <clears> be the smoky notes because a, a good proper <coughs> true vanilla has got a lot of smoky nuances to it that um, might be causing you know, a problem. Cinnamon. I wonder whether um, almond <coughs> might fall into this category of being, uh, you know, a, a, a strong enough flavor that um, can override some of these really disgusting parosmia thing. I mean, I, I have heard people say that they find almond quite safe. Um, I haven't yet run across anyone who's uh, said that it's really um, disgusting to them. Um, it, almond was always a safe one for me. Um, a great option, you know, if you if you wanted to have a pudding or something, you know, you go to sort of the marzipan and, um, but yeah, would be interesting to know. I mean, the almond hide, Jane, as a as a molecule. What's uh, what, do you have any thoughts about that uh, initially? It is a single molecule, is it not? Almond, no. Almond, like anything else, is going to be a whole bunch of things. There's a couple of key ones. Benzaldehyde's probably one of them, um, I think. But um, there's, it's the other things that are in there that um, are causing it the. Um, so I was just saying was that um, it's the other things in there that we don't know about. The, the key thing is that toothpaste, for example, there's key components of toothpaste, which are mint, menthol, key, but it's not the menthol or the uh, minty compounds that are causing the problem. It's something else that nobody even associates with toothpaste. That's the problem. So, you know, <clears throat> the coronavirus doesn't know what things we're sensitive to. Mm -hmm. So it just, um, I'm muttering a bit there. Um, so yeah, it's it's really interesting because in one ways <clears throat> there may be ways that we can work with smell to find smells that are useful to cover up other <coughs> smells. And then in another way, if you're if you're really struggling with food and eating, there's also a strategy that involves minimising the amount of aroma uh, when you're cooking and eating food. So we have all sorts of ways of doing that. I mean, I was just showing my 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 nose clip before, which is a pretty industrial type nose clip, and thinking. I wouldn't want to wear one of these all the time because it completely blocks the smell out, but it would enable you to eat, but it's but it would be uncomfortable to wear all the time. So it can go from that strategy of blocking out all the smells when you're thinking about cooking and eating, or even if just when you're cooking, when the, you get the major aroma release, if you can at least have a nose clip for that part when most of the aroma is going to be released. And then thinking about cooling the food down so that there is less aroma release is one of, one of the other ways of coping with this. So the sort of, in a sense, two strategies, one of finding aromas that work and one of minimizing the aromas in food that can be quite helpful when you're thinking about it. I've been sort of half experimenting with, I know for some people you were saying that um, vegetables can be a problem and I've been doing a little bit of experimentation thinking, okay, one of the things that we need to do here is get over the idea that food should taste of something that we remember it tasting of. Like I expect my coffee to taste like coffee, but for some people who've experienced parosmia a little bit further on, they say it has more of a musty overtone. It doesn't taste like the coffee anymore, but it's still quite pleasant to drink. So um, shifting your attention to the foods being different from you expect from what you expect is part of the challenge of, of living with parosmia, I think. Um, and so that sort of attention shifting can shift you into a different, a different area, which is to become quite curious about what works for you and what doesn't and start playing around with foods that perhaps you would never have thought of putting together. So for example, I've been thinking about, wouldn't it be interesting because I know lots of people find ice cream quite easy to get down. Um, if you could make a savoury salad ice cream, like if you could make ice cream using spinach or something like that, so you get a beautiful colour, really interesting textures. Um, and for you, this might actually be really acceptable. Um, other people may look at you a bit strangely, but, <laughs> but sort of breaking the bounds of what is possible and normal in terms of food, you can really start to experiment with the things that do work for you. So I think the cooling element um, might be really, really helpful for people with cooking. We've talked about this before, Chrissy. Um, 
so that's uh, one of the things that I've been thinking about. But the uh, but the other sort of going back to some of the issues that we've dealt with before, we know that our enjoyment of food is not just about smell and taste. It, it's also about taste. So sweet, sour, bitter, uh, umami, and and um, what did I say? Sweet, sour, bitter, salty, and umami. Um, we tend to go for the salty and sweet, but we could opt more for some of the umami compounds, the savoury flavours. Um, and so we can use some of the other aspects of our sensory perception of food to play with food in a slightly different way. So I like this idea of playing with food, um, making it a bit of a, um, and making a bit of effort to put yourself outside what you expect the food should taste like and moving more into what do I know works for me? I'm a, becoming a sensory detective of my own experience. What do I know works for me? Does colour work? Colour is the Roman gourmand from the first century, Apicius used to say, the first taste is always with the eyes. Can we up the colour content of our food and, and make it more enticing in terms of what it looks like? Um, the taste of food, can we up the umami content so that we can have more of a savoury experience of food? So I think there are lots of interesting ways that we can adjust uh, the food and play with the food a little bit more to make it more acceptable if you're experiencing parosmia. Um, so we have a question here that's coming from Jordan, who's just asked, um, just when we were speaking about vanilla there, uh, do you have any idea why there are differences in parosmia experience for example, why is vanilla safe for some people who have parosmia and unbearable for me? But mm -hmm. that's the case with a lot of people. Some people have two types, well, different types of gene was same with parosmia. So mm -hmm. that's a question for both of you, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there, I think people seem to start out on the same road. So you you begin with parosmia where there's suddenly uh, there's an alteration in your perception of foods. Uh, and then so in the beginning, it's all kind of quite samey. And then those perceptions <coughs> start to coalesce. So instead of just one per, one parosmia smell, you might have two or three that you feel you can put your finger on. And then, uh, you know, I think then it starts to become more and more individual. And it will depend on which receptors are, are uh, you know, are not functioning properly or, or where the connections are uh, not made. Um, but I certainly there's so much variation, you know, some people love cucumbers, some people can't stand them. Uh, <clears throat> if this person's just mentioned vanilla, um, it can be, you know, all, all kinds of things. What I haven't found is someone who said, um, oh yes, frying meat and deep fried foods, that's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. but that one seems to be quite universal. But once you get into um, sort of fruits and vegetables um, and other kinds of flavorings. I think it's a, it's really very individual. And mm -hmm. so we don't really have an answer to that question. It's all right. We've got a, co a couple more questions coming in, if that's all right, just yep. now, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, we've got an anonymous attendee asks, is there any thought to smell training on the molecules that are bothering us? I think we've went over this before. Mm -hmm. Of course, we don't know what the molecules smell like to people who smell them correctly. But my experience for many things has been the more I eat or smell something, the better I smell it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of tolerance type of thing, which is maybe different in parosmia, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's, that's that okay. might be a That might be a Simon Gain kind of question. I don't know. It's the sort of thing that we really want to try. It would answer quite a few questions um, for us. And it would be really interesting to try people training on some of their trigger compounds. Um, it could go either way, so a little bit hesitant because it could make you more sensitive to them. Mm. And um, on the other hand, you could habituate. And that, my guess is that we might get people going in both directions. And the last thing we want to do is um, make anybody's prosmia worse. Um, I, th I it, It's at the back of my mind, it's something that we really ought to try. Um, I think the people that um, well, it, we haven't got hard evidence, but it sounds like the people that actually go and sniff the coffee jar every morning and every evening or force themselves to drink coffee because it's that's their comfort. Um, they're the ones that I think seem to be progressing and it's the ones that don't do that that get stuck. But I've got limited evidence for that. Yeah, but, and, um, and we, we discussed that in one of the previ uh, previous 
webinars on parosmia that, you know, the people who have, who are so revolted, let's say, by the smell of coffee and just keep running away from it, mm -hmm. that, that, that actually there is, I think there's benefit in kind of just pushing through. And with that in mind, I'm just going to launch a quick poll. And I'd like to ask you if you are the kind of person who's tried just eating the food. You, 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 the plate comes in front of you and you think, ugh, I, did, I really don't want to eat this. Then you eat a couple of mouthfuls. And then do you find that after a couple of mouthfuls, somehow you're, you get used to it and you can manage? So here comes the poll. And I'm going to ask you if you would just answer that question. And uh, we'll, we'll see what, what everyone thinks. So people are That's interesting. Yeah. quickly pressing those buttons. Yeah. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is interesting. It, it also uh, reminds me of a comment from somebody that was saying to me, it, take advantage of when you're in a good place, <coughs> try some of these things and stay positive. It's really hard to do, however, when everything's getting you down. Recognize that there are good and bad days and don't dwell on the bad days or bad experiences. Um, so, so this person was suggesting keeping a positive diary of notes of when things are changing and working for you and, wh and when you don't feel up to it, need to be kind to yourself and take days off. So um, yeah, it, I, I think pushing through is great, but not beating yourself up with it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It's interesting that Paul, isn't it? Yes, it yes. is. It's yep. like a it's kind of olfactory fatigue type thing, but it's unusual. But I think it's something to do with the difference between smelling something when you've got a plate in front of you, um, steaming, you're getting all that aroma into your nose, and um, whereas when you put it in your mouth, there's a lot of things that can go on in your mouth that can change that aroma, change the thresholds, change you know things get stuck. In your airways, in your saliva, and um, there's quite possibly quite a big difference between those two. So once you're eating it, it's much more likely to be uh, possible than when you're yeah. smelling it directly, hot, steaming from yeah. the plate. And I guess the longer you're eating it, the more the volatiles will be lost as well from your plate. That's mm -hmm. my guess. But... Mm -hmm. Interesting. So we have a. So do you want to share the results of the poll, Chrissy, or is, is uh, it still good? Did I not? There's I a button I... there for share. Do you want to share it so people can see it? There we are. Yeah. So if you can see that, uh, do you think everyone can see that? I think so. Yeah, sixty yeah. percent. Yes. Okay. Well, that's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Right. So okay. shall we stop sharing now? Yeah. Yeah. That's perfect. Okay, uh, do you just want to keep going with the questions yes. or how are you feeling? Yes. Yeah, let's carry on with the, let's go with the <coughs> yeah. questions. Okay, uh, okay. Um, someone says here, Lindsay says, I've been suffering from post COVID anosmia since October. Does it mean I will also get parosmia? So that's been since October. Um, I would say, uh, Lindsay, um, obviously, I'm not the doctor here. Um, we don't, uh, but, but but from what I know, um, Parosmia can come on quite a few months later, so it may come to you yet. And we also know that some people don't get it. So I, I am not sure that uh, you, th there's nothing to say for sure that you will get parosmia. Um, so uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that too, too much. Um, if you do get it, of course, we want you to come back and, and get the help that you need from us. Um, Callan has asked about antibiotics or steroids, um, and are they helpful for parosmia? Uh, the answer to that would have to be no, um, not as far as we know. Um, there was an interesting webinar with uh, Nancy Rawson and Federica Genovese from the Manel Center um, talking about what's happening actually more on a sort of cellular level. And I think that um, the, the question that came up on that during that webinar was, um, is smell training good for parosmia? And I think that the answer would have to be not that we know of. It helps, smell training helps in a general sense, but is not um, something that's going to make the parosmia go away. And similarly, um, I don't think at this point there's any reason to believe that steroids or um, um, antibiotics are going to actually solve the problem mm -hmm. of parosmia. 
Right. Uh, okay. Ooh, Andrea, that's interesting. What, what do you think? <coughs> Um, I just spotted an interesting question. It's all right. Let's let's take it from Aidan. Sure. Okay. Um, someone's asked here in the chat bar. Uh, Abidos asks, uh, "Is there a connection between getting head cold-like symptoms?" Oh, sorry, it's scrolled up there. Uh, is there a connection between getting a head like head cold-like symptoms and loss of change in smell? A link between head cold, so that's like flu-like kind of symptoms, isn't it? And loss of change of smell. Well, actually, head cold can be kind of like um, sinusitis, isn't it? So yeah, I think there is. Uh, a link between that definitely. Um, someone's asked here, have you looked into flavour levels at all and whether the virus is destroying specific elements within that? I find I get what I would consider to be the top notes of a lot of food and drinks. For example, wine tastes like vinegar with no body. Some people have said that before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you looked at this type of research? Uh, any use? Back to you, Jane. Uh, so I was trying to find the question. Is it in the question? Yeah. And um, can I just please ask everyone, do not post questions in the chat bar because it's we're too looking confusing. at the other one. Yeah, yeah it's, it's too confusing having two lots of questions going on. So if you've asked in the chat bar, um, we're not, we will ignore those questions. Please post your questions in the Q&A uh, bar. It's, it's mm -hmm. by Maria. Um, Jane, you can see that. So is it destroying specific elements? Um, we don't know. Um, it's possible. Um, actually, when I put um, Prosmix on the GCO, there's usually a big gap at the beginning, and that means that the most volatile ones, they're not picking up. So it's not all about top notes for certain, um, as most of the volatile ones um, people tend to miss. Mm. So it's a very good question. Um, yeah, very good question. I mean, the, the thing that links all these molecules together is their potency. They're all highly odor active. So they're the kind of molecule that you can detect if you put a tiny drop in a swimming pool and the whole swimming pool would then smell of gravy or peas or whatever it is. So they are incredibly, incredibly potent aroma compounds. Um, and that's what links them all together. I haven't seen anybody react to one of a any of the sort of normal level um, aroma compounds. Um, Chrissy, do, do you think that um, nasal rinsing helps with parosmia? I, I don't think particularly, <laughs> no. <clears throat> I think the only thing that helps with parosmia is time. Yeah. And uh, these other interventions which may help keep your airways clean, keep, keep air flow going, uh, you know, and, and help your sort of um, the health of your sinuses. That's, that's one thing. But parosmia is really a problem of the nerves and that is not going to be helped by either drugs or these kind of interventions, at least not that we know of. You know, maybe, maybe in time we will find something that actually can, can change that, but I don't think those kind of interventions will have any effect on parosmia. And I, 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 I really do believe that the best way of combating parosmia is to just go up against it head to head and keep, keep experimenting and keep trying with foods that you feel. Um, I mean, obviously, you don't want to make yourself sick, but if you can keep that open mind thing that uh, Deka was talking about, keep experimenting and keep going back to foods that you maybe, you know, for you might say, well, since I, since I lost my sense of smell, I haven't tried eating radishes, so I'll try those out and see what kind of an experience that is. I have, I have found, and as you probably all know, I've lost my sense of smell twice and I've had bad parosmia twice. Um, I have found, uh, always uh, been able to discover surprisingly foods that I'm interested in eating that I didn't used to be interested in eating. So I would, I would uh, recommend being, um, keeping an open mind for that kind of uh, experimentation. Mm -hmm. oh, I was just going to say, and perhaps focus on keep, keeping an open mind and focusing on the idea that the nerves are regenerating so that it gives you a, a sense of positivity about that journey as well. Right, let's have another question. Yeah, I've got someone here asking, this is quite an interesting one, lots of foods have a parosmic taste and really not nice to eat, and yet they do not smell at all, which is quite interesting in that sense. What do you think? 
I spotted that question mm -hmm. and it's very interesting. Um, and I can't explain it. Um, I don't know if the, you want to give any yeah. examples. It is. Yeah, very, yeah. Yeah, it's very hard to work out why you can't yeah. smell them, but you can taste yeah. them. I wonder. Sure, if you could give I us examples, that'd be good. Yes, I'm wondering if, if um, I mean, we have to be really specific about what we mean by taste and, well, and smell here, which is um, because obviously smell is is the odours, taste is sweet, sour, bitter, salty, and umami, but there's also the trigeminal. And one of the issues that's been coming up in the Facebook group that's been really interesting is people talking about feeling smoke, for example, rather than necessarily being able to smell it. Um, so I wonder if, if they're... I mean, I'm not quite sure we need to drill down a bit more to know if they're talking yeah. about taste on the tongue yeah. or if they're talking about trigeminal stimulation. Mm, it could even be because if you've lost the smell, you've only got the texture and things. And perhaps when you lose that, maybe you don't like the texture because you think about things differently. Like I wouldn't like marshmallows if it didn't have a, a flavour. So I mean, mm. I think it's interesting. Mm. Um, we've got our... Uh, um, Got Barry Smith here. He's very he's very um, regular here on the um, the webinars. We really appreciate all of his thoughts. But he has a question for us. So Barry asks, should we try to discover whether smell training that leads to improvement in other familiar smells leads to faster regularization in the distorted smells and quicker recovery from parosmia? So train on the safe compounds. Mm. Mm. That's the other part of the story. I was we were talking about training on coffee. It's the two sides of the balance really <clears throat> because you want to you do want to train I think on as many safe compounds as you can because I think you're stimulating those nerves to grow back and making those connections so I think yes and I think probably the wider you can cast your net the the more smells you can train on the better um, and by doing that you'll be raising um, the aromas you you'll get a wider range of aromas mm -hmm. with which you could hide the coffee for example mm -hmm. so you'll be getting more nice ones that will mask the ones that are coming through as particularly perosmic yeah. so yes i think that's true um and that's part of smell training anyway you've got four very different um essential oils um and then the coffee or the triggers is the other part and that that's slightly riskier but I think yes, Barry. But, but Jane, let, let me let me uh, point something out on that. We 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 talk about the four sort of classic rose, lemon, clove, and eucalyptus, and of course, uh, there's no reason why those are better than any others. They were just the, the ones that were used by Professor Hummel in the original study, and then of course they did, that got reproduced um, a lot. Um, and. Jane, you just mentioned that we, we want to, to train with a broad range of, of mm -hmm. smells just to get you know, the, the broadest palette imaginable. But I've been, I've been experimenting with um, some essential oils of trees. So I've got 10 uh, essential oils of trees and mm -hmm. they are some of them very similar. And I find that there's actually a great deal of depth in comparing six things that are, the first time I smelled them, I thought, well, they're basically all the same. Is this even gonna be a challenge? But I have been um, revisiting them and revisiting them and, and exploring them um, over and over. And what I'm finding is that they're actually all quite different. And so even though as a category, that's very narrow, uh, I feel as though I'm discovering things. I'm discovering nuances that I didn't know were there. And that also has to be valuable. Uh, you know, it has, it, it I, go I ahead. Think, I think if anybody does that, they'll end up learning the differences. And um, I think that's not just for prosmics. I mean, you can learn to taste wine, you can learn to um, taste tea, taste coffee, all these different things. You, people can learn to distinguish between them. So, yes, I'm sure it's valuable as well. Yes. I mean, basically, I think the more that you, um, subject your senses to different aromas the better or as you say small differences it's all about training so in that case you're training to discriminate between small differences on the other hand you're training to sort of boost as many aromas as possible so i think yeah. there's 
very little you can do wrong in the well in the way of um sniffing things mm-hmm. yeah well Barry just said here people have the same response to whiskies and wines at first but then to learn to discriminate and get more acute mm-hmm. so yeah mm-hmm. Barry would be Barry knows about yeah. all that yeah. um we have it seems from the style of questions that are come up here they're more related to ways of coping and I believe that's something we're going to speak about <laughs> a little bit later on like for example water is being mentioned here is is tasting prosmic which is, is something that we've found doesn't it so um so yeah. yes um jacob would you like to talk about water yeah i mean we've been we've been starting to do a little bit of research around this because it's quite clear that some people uh for some people water triggers parosmia and for other people it doesn't and and because we we now are much more conscious of the fact that these the triggers are chemicals in the water we've become much more interested in where you get your water from um, as to why these these might be triggering you in different in, in different places so um, we will be following up with a survey very soon on the Facebook group and I hope everybody will join in on that where we'll be starting to kind of drill down and find out what your water source is so for example the average water company I know when I was living in Newcastle they would actually draw their water from three different sources so they would have groundwater, they'd have river water and they'd have a lake that they used to get the water from and interestingly when when they'd need to take the water from a different source than normal, they would get hundreds and hundreds of complaints because people would notice the change in the taste of the water. So we can become very habituated to to water tasting of something in particular, and often when it changes is when we notice it. But for somebody who's experiencing parosmia, it may well be that there are actual things (coughs) in the water that are triggering that um, or making us more sensitive to things like chlorine that are already in the water. So that's one of the areas that, that we're working with with Jane and some, some people in the United States at the moment is, is trying to drill down to what it is in water that triggers that. But again, I guess for, for anybody that's experiencing that, and if you are finding that even showering can be, can be difficult, first thing again is to remember the temperature issue. So if you heat water up, it's going to have more, more odour. Um, so when you're having a bath, you're likely to experience that more than, say, if you're, if you're taking cold water out of the tap. So there are all sorts of different strategies that you can use to minimise minimize that impact. Some people buy bottled water, um, but even bottled water can vary in terms of what's in the bottled water. So if you try one brand and find that that's still triggering parosmia, you could, you could probably go for a different brand. Um, You can buy a filter, Uh, you can put a filter on on your tap just for drinking, or you can put a filter on the whole house um, to minimise that that, uh, smell uh, being triggered. So there's lots of different strategies for it, but I think it's really interesting, and perhaps Jane, um, you've already started thinking about what it is that people are actually just picking up um, smells that are already there, and what it is that's triggering parosmia. We're We're not actually quite sure yet. Um, yeah, it's one of the things we're going to be looking at because there are quite a number of aroma compounds present in water, again, at very, very low levels, um, that could be triggers. Um, a lot of people are describing it as chlorine, but then a lot of people are describing prosmic smells as chlorine and bleach as well. So I'm not totally wed on it being a chlorine compound. It might be. Um, and there are several things in there. And I think this is a bit of a plug because um, we are starting a project on this uh, with Dacre. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm looking to, well, I'm thinking about sending out aroma compounds in water to um, people within the UK initially. Um, So you can have a sniff of all these samples and you can feed back to me which are the ones that are triggering your parosmia. Um, It's a little bit easier to do with water than it is to do with food. and we can dose in very low levels. Um, so if you're in the UK and you want to, me to send you out some samples, it's in progress. Um, we're just thinking about the best way to do it. There's a limited number. There's about 20 different compounds that I've got on my list. I may have to narrow that down. Um, and they're all quite diverse. They come from different things. You know, some of them are microbial. Some of them are to do with the chlorine. Some of them are a mixture of the two. Um, it's, it's an interesting one, but... I would love to have people in the in my lab and screen them as I have done for the coffee, but it's 
a little bit harder because of COVID and it's a little bit harder because it's they're water soluble things as well. Right. Um, but, yeah, but I think also it, it, if we can find some kind of clusters of people who are experiencing oh. this in particular areas and look at whether there's, you're using a similar water supply. So it's it's a very interesting area that we that we need to learn more about i think yeah no it's let, let, let me just jump in here um as you as all of you in the audience can see we are a hive of research mm -hmm. and um uh, the you know the things that we're learning every day it's all sort of coming thick and fast we've got lots and lots of ideas we're trying to kind of put them together in a in a coherent way and 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 get some really a better understanding out of what you're saying in the Facebook groups. And uh, so I think this would be a great time for me to mention that um, absent, the absent Facebook groups are going to be changing at the end of the month. We are moving to a new platform, which will be less noisy, um, much better for you uh, as a person with smell loss, because you'll be able to tailor your page within this new network. It's called the Mighty Networks. Um, you'll be able to tailor your own page so that you can get rid of all the stuff that you're not interested in and you can focus on the things that you are interested in. And one of the areas that we'll be having there, uh, which is very important to, uh, to me and everybody at Absent, is the research that we're doing. So very important that you understand that as someone with smell loss, you are contributing to the research. Mm -hmm. And in this area within the new network, you will be able to see what kind of um, research is going on, what the latest information is. Mm -hmm. And um, I had this conversation with Barry Smith the other day, how important it is when we have cr created, uh, when we've written a paper and it's been published, that we feed that back to you uh, in the audience so that you know what your contribution has been. And we want to develop this kind of virtuous circle so that you as a participant with smell loss really feel that your contributions um, within this area are, are helping other people like yourself. So that's gonna be launching at the end of January. <clears throat> Excuse me, it will be signposted within the Facebook group, on Twitter, uh, on the website, obviously anybody who gets our newsletter will also get information about that. So do stop by and we will be a kind of, um, right next door in a sort of semi-detached house kind of relationship with the Altered Eating Network and all of the great stuff that they do. So um, I hope that you will join the Mighty Networks. It's free. Um, it's just a better way of getting your information, getting into conversations with other people where there's less noise and it's just easier to keep track of the kind of discussions that we're having. So thank you for listening to that plug. Right, uh, shall we go to some more questions, Aidan? Yes. Um, um, someone's asking here, um, will smell and taste ever go back to normal? If so, how long on average does it take? Does Claire have any type of research on that? Or it's more just the prevalence of parosmia, isn't it? Uh, right now, the very latest, excuse me, <clears throat> the very latest is that 50% um, of people who lose their sense of smell um, so let's, sorry, let me dial that back and start. Uh, roughly 60% of people who get COVID-19 have self-reported smell loss. Now we actually think it might be a higher rate than that, but people aren't noticing that, they're, that they've had impairment to their sense of smell. But at least from people's reports, it's about 60%. Of that 60%, half will recover within a couple of weeks and be perfectly fine. The other half will have longer, will take longer to recover. Um, uh, and, and that the definition of longer is over eight weeks. So uh, obviously there's a little area there in the middle, but um, some people obviously are taking longer. And for a, for a few, it will be a very long recovery period, but no one can say which group you're falling into uh, at the very beginning, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, uh, do we know if there are any patterns or consistencies to the order which we go through fluctuations or stages? And this person has actually progressed to say, <laughs> for, in for instance, I've progressed from sickly sweet, rotten flesh, rubbish slash swill, I haven't heard of swill before, for skunky sulfur, 
five onion and then lastly vomit and that sounds a really um horrible yeah. um progression through that but f thanks for elaborating mm -hmm. any patterns or consistencies to the order which people go through fluctuations or stages mm -hmm. chrissy no one's went into that much detail about it really no i mean we we know that uh, the the I'm covid smell the the parosmia smell varies but i'm not sure that we that that we we've seen that specific a pattern in how it varies. Um, There's all sorts of ways these different prosmias, um, different prosmia characters can be seen. Some people start off with three different things. One sickly sweet, one is chemical and one is onion. And that's quite typical. Mm. But other people get two of them in the same molecule even, the same food and the same molecule. They can say, oh, that's a bit of one and a bit of two. And some people say, well, coffee used to smell of this and now it smells of that. So we've got all sorts of different scenarios and that, that's just COVID, isn't it? They just, um, it's making it difficult for us because we, we can't explain. Um, what I do know mm. is that when we've got prosmia one and prosmia two, for example, so one is sweetly sick and sickly and the other is chemical smoky, that they are linked to different compounds, different molecules. Um, it's tentative because we haven't got a lot of data, but it does look like when I was looking at one person who said, okay, that one's number one, that one's number two, mm -hmm. that one's number one, I could tell that they were different compounds. So by the end of his run in our lab, I could guess which ones he was going to choose. Mm. So um, that's one pattern, but I'm sure there are other patterns as well. And how you come with so many different in, in sort of sequential um, I don't know, because that suggests that different receptors are popping up and going down or becoming active mm. and inactive um, at different times. And that that gets very complicated, but it's very interesting. I might record that. Um, is it in the chat? I think we need to record that. Yeah, it's a nice mm. example. But I, I will like... uh, I will send that to um, Jane. I dismissed it, but I will send you that. OK, That's really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so excuse me. So, Uh, someone's asking here, um, will eating extremely flavorful foods like spicy, salty, mm. sweet make it more difficult to recover my sense of smell? Mm. I wouldn't say so. I can't say what, can't see why. No, I don't think it's so. It's good to get the spicy, salt and sweet. If you are lacking <laughs> in that, well, the person is a bit different, but. There's, there's, there's the issues around having some enjoyment and joy, which I think is really important. It's, it's very difficult to continuously eat bland food without any kind of feedback. So I think um, you need to sort of meter out some, some loving kindness to yourself to have a little bit of joy in mm. there um, and not worry so much. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, does Reading University need any volunteers with anosmia for help with research? Jane, we're soon. Anosmia in the, possibly not because, well, I won't say no, never, mm -hmm. but for the sort of studies that we're doing at the moment, we need people that can smell because we put them on our, we test them with different aromas and we put them on our instrument and you have to be able to smell things. If you've got anosmia with some prosmia coming through, that that's quite interesting. Um, but apart from all that, at the moment, we've sort of stopped because um, we're not having people in the department um, at the moment. Um, it's quite a high priority project. So I think the department, I think they'll let me in quite soon. But we have halted any volunteer work for the time we, being. We hope so, because we always like to hear your research, Jane. It's always fascinating. Uh, um, some, oh, so, so what were you going to say? No, it's all right. Uh, nothing. Go ahead. Uh, Nat, Nat, someone here has just asked, um, have you identified cultural differences in the types of food that is edible? Now that is actually quite interesting. That's part of one of the surveys I've put out is looking at what people eat and what their ethnic background is and where they actually live. And we were going to send them out samples, but I think we might end up, I've heard of some samples that got stuck on the way out to China, oh. because unless you can show proof of what they are and where they come from um, it gets harder so my grand plan was to look at just that um, how far and wide I'll be able to 
send my samples is a, is another matter. But we can still have some. We will still have some results from the survey, um, but they may be less useful than sending samples out. But mm -hmm. watch this space because I think we've just closed that survey and yeah. we're on to we're on to analysing that now as well. Mm. Well, the, the culture. Sorry, if I could just comment, Amy. And, and let's not forget that participating in research does not necessarily mean going to a lab. No. no. Participating in research can mean something as simple as answering a questionnaire. And that is so, so important. Um, and that's why, you know, when you answer questions in the Facebook discussion topics and things like that, it's, it's just, you know, like gold dust, uh, hearing all your comments and looking at them and kind of like adding them up and looking for trends and things like that. So um, a survey is a great way for you to participate. Yes. Um, right. So we've got, um, let's see now, I think Barry. Oh, right. Okay, that came up. Good point. And not all research goes on in universities. Absolutely right. I mean, look at the absent mm -hmm. Facebook group. We're not a university. I'm lucky enough to have wonderful colleagues who are at universities and who are letting me um, you know, bring what we're doing in the Facebook group um, to them so that they can, yeah. like, you know, put, put uh, an envelope of, of, of academia around it. Um, but it's like it's, it's like absent university for us because we were learning so much just from other people. So there we are. We need to start that up. Absent university. I'll we have another all degree. Graduates of the absent university. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay. So what else do we have here? Um, someone else has just uh, piped in here about the stages of smell, which is quite interesting. Um, someone says here, I can really, I can really relate to uh, Carol's stages of smell, which we just listened to. And mm -hmm. I'm going through the sulfur, onion and vomit stage at the moment, seven months in. That's, that's a long time. The, the smoky burning smell was my original stage for most foods, and that has pretty much gone. Mm -hmm. So that's sulfur, more... onion and vomit. Yeah, that's... I think that's the more common pathway. And I think um, from the work we've done, people start off with this chemical smell and it covers everything probably. And then as things are getting better, you start to discriminate. And that's when you start to get the onion separate from the, uh, the chemical and, mm. and maybe the sulfur. I'm not sure about the sulfur. But um, yes, I think it's probably a good sign because I think it's a sign that you're starting to discriminate. And mm. then hopefully the next stage is that some of these aromas will, the prosmia will go down a little bit and you'll say, oh, there's a little bit of the real aroma coming through. Um, mm. And I that's maybe the, that's maybe, uh, particularly when you're researching and things like prosmia, a person can change so quickly that by the time you maybe perhaps get them in, it's, it's, it, it's mm. not a, a distortion. So, so yeah, so it's very interesting how this all, all changes for people, isn't it? Yeah. Right, Aidan, I'm, I'm spying the question for the comment from Elena uh, Oh yeah, do you want me to read that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, with anosmia after COVID last March, uh, I gently rediscovered some good flavours. Mm. Um, I clearly have parosmia with bitter stuff, uh, like coffee, mm. cocoa and beer. But the fact that I can't smell any stench, like the burning gasoline sweat ex excrements, could also be a form of prosmia. So it's a kind of good prosmia, but it's still a distortion. So that's what do you think yeah, of that? A, yeah, that sounds like prosmia to me. Mm. I would add, like, add there are two parts to prosmia. There's the part where you lose your sense of smell and it's starting to grow back. So all these aromas that you normally smell you can't smell and as they grow back it gets slightly better and then the second part of prosmia is these things that you can smell really strong and they're yeah. re revolting repulsive and they need to come back down again so are there things like that in coffee gin do you think well yeah i mean anything for, there will for be, people there that... will be um the prosmic smells and then everything else and for us mm. we mix all that together and come up with the smell of coffee for parosmics, they're missing everything else and they've only got these potent sulfur compounds. They're not horrible to us, um, which is another fascinating thing with parosmia that they're a bit strong, they're a bit potent, but um, you know, normally they're okay for us. Uh, and for the prosmics, it's um, distorted or 
it's not just distorted it's um quite highly changed i would say mm. but yeah mm. Um, yeah, so just got a question just now. Um, Post COVID, I originally had the smell of petrol fumes. Fumes. Now it's cigarette smoke. I have no sense of taste, but some smells are coming through gradually. So, do I have parosmia or anosmia? Well, that sounds to me like parosmia. Um, yeah. I sm oh well, it depends if that's in the absence of smells, because the petrol fume cigarette that sounds like phantosmia, but there's a whole kind of crosstalk, isn't there? Mm -hmm. I mean, the two things can happen in parallel. So one thing is how much can you smell? Uh, if you've got a normal sense of smell, it's normosmia. If you've got none, it's anosmia and you can be anywhere in between. And then superimpose on top of that parosmia where some things are distorted. So again, you, it's not just parosmia or anosmia, it can be both. Um, yeah, and as Aidan was saying, it, you know, there's all sorts of combinations you can have. Yes, there's a great deal of variation within that area. Mm -hmm. um, steam inhalation in the beginning. I think someone says steam distillation might have helped. Is that we never really speak about steam just um, steam inhalation as a form of that's more congestion in these types. But I think with COVID, it might not be related to congestion. I know that we we have been recommending gentle steam inhalation for the many people that talk about these really dry, painful nostrils. Um, you know that it feels as though the whole upper airway is kind of dried out, and that is a very, very unpleasant feeling, and almost gives you a headache. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that might be useful for that, just as a little temporary relief. But I don't think steam inhalations in general, and I and I, it, I you'd want to be careful because anything mm. that's really hot might be in the long run, um, you know, dangerous for your these such delicate tissues. Yeah, well, we're getting uh, quite close to the the end point. We've had a lot of questions today, haven't yes, we? we have. Indeed. We have. Um. um uh, Nat has asked about alpha lipoic acid. That will have to be for another webinar, Nat. Um, that would be more about supplements and mm -hmm. um, alternative remedies. Um, so I think we can dismiss that one. So Carol says she's seven months in. She forgot to say chemical gas was the first one. I assume, Carol, that what you mean is that this chemical kind of gas smell was your first smell message that you felt you could perceive and I'm not sure whether you mean that I think that was before the sickly sweet I think right but, hmm, like I'm a captain can I think that's what I'm not really sure about right right yeah, yeah. Okay. okay so yeah Carol's saying yes to that so yeah it's, it's before the sickly sweet so it's a chemical gas well, that's interesting I, I'm I'm going to feed that back to Jane if that's all right Right, well, we're coming to the end. So I'd like to thank everyone who's put up a question. Um, we've had quite a big group here tonight. Parosmia is always a hot topic because I know so many people suffer from it. Mm -hmm. um, in two weeks, I will be here um, in the evening speaking with um, a group that have launched a symptom tracking app called People With. And this is a very interesting tool and we hope to be using it in our own research. Um, and that will again be happening within the new absent network. Um, so that will all be happening say at the very end of the month. So to coincide with that, I will have um, the, the founder of People With um, to discuss what their app, their, they have a free app and what we can do with it to help us in our research. So um, I hope that you will join us on that evening and to learn more about it um, and just to see how you can uh, contribute to a better understanding of what's happening to people with their sense of smell um, after COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So I guess I should say thank you to my guests. So thank you, Aidan, uh, for answering the pad, the, the, the Q&A question so wonderfully. Um, thank you, Jane, for joining us in your lovely red, <laughs> red background what? there. And thank you, jumper. Yes, and thank you, Deka, also for, for joining me. So I hope to see you in two weeks, everyone. 
Um, and it's been lovely to have your company and really thank you again for being part of the absent community. You are, you know, you're a force for good and you're really helping everyone else like yourself. So good night, everyone. See good night. You. Thanks for the questions. Bye. Yeah. Good night.